السلام عليكم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين One of the articles of faith in Islam is the belief in divine destiny or divine plan or God's will or qada wa qadar defined as a principle which says Allah knows everything in the creation. He has a plan for everything and is in charge of everything. And everything that happens in this universe happens by the will and decree of Allah. Regarding qada wa qadar and Allah's decree, the Quran says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Badi'u samawati wal ardi wa idha qada amran fa inna ma yaqulu lahu kun fa yakun. The originator of the heavens and the earth, when he decrees a matter, he only says to it be and it is. Chapter 2, verse 117. Here qada is translated as his decree. And then qadar in another verse, وَكَانَ أَمْرُ اللَّهِ قَدَرًا مَقْدُورًا And the command of Allah is a decree determined or certain destiny. Chapter 33, verse 38, where قَدَرًا مَقْدُورًا is translated as determined degree or certain degree, firm decree, where there are no doubts about it. At the same time, Islam says that human beings have free will to do good or bad deeds. The concept of qada wa qadar, or divine destiny, is not in contradiction with free, free will. However, for a Muslim, it basically means that everything that happens to him has a purpose or a reason. It also gives Muslims a sense of patience. Uh, when something bad happens, a calamity, a difficulty, since they believe it is part of God's plan, then they should be patient when they encounter them and be thankful for good fortunes or good events when something good happens to them. While above definition seems simple, divine destiny is one of the principles that is often hard to understand when it is combined with free will. Hence, has been a point of debate or even subject to misunderstandings. We will, inshallah, address this topic in today's session and we will also address few questions that have been raised in the Qur'an Jalasa, uh, often regarding this topic. They often say the following. If God has written or decreed committing sin for me, then why would he punish me and put me in hell fire for committing it? And if his, you know, if in his knowledge I was destined to go to hell, to hell fire, then why do I need to obey his commands or be a good person? By the same token, if I am among those destined to enter paradise, Jannah, how could committing sin and doing wrong harm me or change that. Therefore, let's do whatever we want. Generally speaking, there are people who either have difficulty understanding the concept of qada wa qadar and sincerely seeking answers. And then there are those who are really looking for a way to justify their deeds and actions through this concept. In this session and the next we would like to address the specific questions about Qada wa Qadar and shed some light on the concept of free will. We also want to prove not only we make our destiny with our a'mal, but also we cannot bring Qada wa Qadar as an excuse to do whatever we want. Because we want to explore this topic from Quranic and rational perspectives. Therefore, we want to spend some time understanding the basic concept as we answer the related questions in a comprehensive way. We will demonstrate the concept of qada wa qadar first with given examples, then move on to the concept of free will and determinism. Our hope is by the time we finish 
these two sessions, we will have shed some light on the topic from not just Quranic, but also analytical perspectives. They say, well, everything has been written, decreed, and set in motion from eternal past, pre-existent. The unfortunate and fortunate, the success and the failure, the blessed and the cursed have all been determined or predestined. Then they cite the following verse from the Quran. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ سَبَقَتْ لَهُمْ مِنَّ الْحُسْنَ أُولَئِكَ عَنْهَا مُبْعَدُونَ Those for whom the good records from us have gone before, ahead, will be removed far from it. From what? From hell. Chapter 21, verse 101. Meaning, those to whom a good record has been written and sent forward, they will be far away or saved from the hellfire. Therefore, murder has been written to the murderer, hence he has no choice. Or, we have no choice in committing any act. Then, according to this understanding, we cannot say Adam salam, committed a sin either. Ibn Taymiyyah says that this type of people are worse than Christians and Jews because Ahl al-Kitab at least believe in some form of rewards and punishments, enjoining good and forbidding evil. So the above claim about Qada wa Qadar is invalid for multiple reasons, and we'll go through this. Number one, first explaining the verse above. This verse and the verse before it are talking about those who will enter paradise and those who will enter hell. In verse 100 and verses before it, Quran talks about their idols, the idol worshippers' idols, that will become the fuel to hellfire. And idolaters will call them and ask for help. But the idols, if they were real, would not enter hellfire and cannot hear them. Then in contrast, verse 101 says, on the other hand, those who are in paradise, those to whom a promise of paradise has been, had been given because of the deeds they had sent forth, will be far away from the cries of those in hellfire. In other words, this verse talks about people who chose a way of life for which God has promised, has given glad tiding of being saved from the hellfire. By no means this verse implies anything about determinism, Jabr, or any predestined fate for certain people. This type of interpretation has many major issues and implications, some of which we will touch on. Number two, contradiction between one's narrative and actions. What they say and what they do are two different things. Whoever brings qada wa qadar as an excuse or argument to do whatever he wants to justify his actions must accept the fact that God's decree in divine destiny in qada wa qadar is not just for him. It is for everyone. So then it becomes an argument or justification for everyone because all people have a share in qada wa qadar. This understanding then necessitates that if someone committed a wrongdoing against you, any injustice against you, cussed you, slandered you, took your wealth and disrespected you, he can then tell you, Neither you nor anyone else can blame him because it's all in Qada wa Qadar. However, we know he's lying because the minute any of it happens to him, he will blame the whole world. He will no longer say it is in Qada wa Qadar, hence contradicts himself. 
In reality, according to this understanding or belief, if we can call it that, anything that happens to him, he should be upfront and consistent and say it is due to predestination and not blame anything or anyone. But we know that is not the case. The minute the same thing happens to him, the first thing he does is to condemn that person's action who caused him harm. It is obvious no one receives any injustice against himself or herself without retribution, without blaming others. If that was the case, the whole world would be full of corruption. Therefore, we conclude their narrative, their claim from logical point of view is baseless and does not make sense. And not to mention being a form of kuf from you know, the faith point of view. Hence, those who bring qada wa qadar as a reason or excuse to justify their actions are dishonest. According to Ibn Taymiyyah, in reality, the basis for such an understanding is the rejection of faith itself or kufr. Why? Because, according to, his underst to this understanding, Iblis, Fir'aun, Nuh's nation, Ad, Thamud, and all the nations that Allah mentions he punished in the past due to their sins and misconducts are all excused. Such understanding is a form of disbelief that all faiths concur. Now, according to the Quran, believers and unbelievers are not equal. In other words, the above notion the above claim that qada wa qadar implies determinism requires us that we make no distinction between the enemies of Allah and friends of Allah, between the believers who are dwellers of paradise and the unbelievers who are dwellers of hellfire. Whereas the Quran says, وَمَا يَسْتَوِي الْأَعْمَى وَالْبَسِيرُ وَلَا الظُّلُمَاتُ وَلَا النُّورُ وَلَا ذِلُّ وَلَا الْحَرُورُ وَمَا يَسْتَوِيَ الْأَحْيَاءُ وَالْأَمْوَاتُ The blind and the seeing are not equal, nor are darkness and light, nor are the chilly shade and the heat of the sun, nor are the living and the dead equal. Chapter 35, verse, verses 19 through 22. Or, أَمْ نَجْعَلُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ كَالْمُفْسِدِينَ فِي الْعَرْضِ Am Najal al-Muttaqina kal fujjar Shall we treat those who believe and do good works as those who spread corruption on earth? Or shall we treat the pious as the wicked? Chapter 38, verse 28. Or Am Hasib al Ladina Shtarahu Sayyat Am Najalahum kal Ladina Amanu wa Amilu Salihat Sabaun Mahyahum wa Mamatuhum Sa Mayahkamun. Do those who commit evil deeds think that we will hold them equal to the believers who do good works so that in life and death they, are, they shall be alike? How wrongly they judge. Sa ma 25, 21. Chapter 25, verse 21. If everyone was predestined by Allah to do good, or do evil, why does Allah draw this distinction between them in these verses? How could just, you know, say, I, I, you know, he, I guess you could also say that Allah could just simply say that I have willed some to go to hell and some go to go to paradise, so do whatever you wish in this world. While Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything, and his knowledge is absolute and encompassing, he also knows that he has given us the free will, ikhtiyar, to choose before we commit any act. I repeat, because this is one of the core concepts I want everyone to master. While Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything and his knowledge is absolute and encompassing, he also knows that he has given us the free will, ikhtiyar, 
to choose before we commit any act. This says, Qada wa Qadar cannot be used as an excuse to justify our actions. And his knowledge includes our free will. Number three, belief in de uh, divine destiny, qada wa qadar, but not using it as a justification. We do believe in the divine plan, which says Allah is in control and supervises everything. But it is a false reasoning and excuse to use it to justify our actions. If that was the case, then when Iblis brought his excuse to God, it should have been accepted. His excuse should have been accepted from him. And from that point, any excuse anyone brings must be accepted. Hence, all sinners, all criminals, all wrongdoers would be pardoned and immune from punishment. No thief or murderer is responsible for his action. There's no need to enjoin people to do what is, you know, that which is good and forbid them from that which is evil. Not need to strive and struggle, jihad. No need, you know, we, we shouldn't stop people from disbelieving. According to Sahih Muslim and Bukhari, Prophet Ali was asked about this and he said, there is no one among you except that his place has been written in paradise or hell. He was then asked, so should we not rely on this decree and stop our actions? Prophet ﷺ replied, no, except you must strive and do what you can to achieve what you were created for. Number four. Divine destiny, qada wa qadar, does not reject asbab, means and causations. As we said, Allah Almighty is aware of everything and he has decreed them or written everything according to his absolute knowledge, which is not bound by time. For example, he knows who will believe and do righteous deeds, hence end up in paradise. And he knows who will disobey and commit wrongdoings, hence end up in hellfire. He knows, for example, who will marry whom and who will be their child or children. Who plants the seed in, in his land and hence benefit from his labor and in, har you know, in the harvest time. Now, if someone says, if it is written for me to go to paradise, then I will enter it without good deeds anyway. I repeat, if someone says, if it is written for me to go to paradise, then I will enter it without good deeds anyway. The answer is no. This is a false statement because he, you know, he will only enter paradise with the good deeds through righteous deeds. In fact, if he, enter par if he enters paradise without good deeds, then it contradicts with, all, you know, with what Allah knows and has written or decreed for him. In other words, Allah knows he will go to paradise because he will decide to do good deeds and stay away from bad deeds. This is like a married couple saying, I'm going to give you an example here. This is like a married couple saying, we want a child, but we will not get pregnant to have one. If Allah has written for us to have a child, then eventually we will have one without going through pregnancy. Of course, this is absurd because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed for them to have a child, it is through the process of pregnancy that their child will be born to them. This is part of the couple's action. 
Allah has not decreed for them to have a child without this process. Here, we say pregnancy is the asbab or means to have the child. And what Allah created in the couple's nature is the causation. All of which are required for them to have a child. Entering Jannah, paradise, is the same way. Anyone who thinks he can get there without iman and righteous deeds, he is wrong. Similarly, anyone who thinks whether he stays away from that which is haram, forbidden, uh, or not, does not make any difference for him, he is wrong and has indeed committed a cough disbelief. So, then the very first verse we recited, we, uh, you know, in this section, which we said, those, that was chapter 21, verse 102, those for whom the good record from us has gone before will be removed far away from it, from hellfire. Means, if from Allah Azza wa Jal, a good record has been written, it is decreed based on the specific deeds that person chose to conduct. The righteous actions he chose to take that will cause him to stay away from hellfire. In other words, of course Allah wants all of us to enter paradise. He created us to reach the peak of our perfection, our humanity, with the ultimate goal of being among the Salihin and enter paradise. However, that is not his decree. That is not in his divine plan. He has decreed some to go to paradise and some to go to hell based on the actions, amal, each and every one of us choose to conduct and his decree includes these choices he has decreed for so and so to have a child but that is going to that is only going to happen through the process of pregnancy because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed the causes and the means asbab and musababat therefore if someone believes Allah has recorded good for him without a'mal, without deeds, he is wrong and astray. Number five, we are empowered and capable to do, to, to do anything within the choices we have. One cannot bring excuses like, I'm unable to do anything and don't have the capability, etc., etc. Allah has given capabilities to all, some more than others. And He only holds us responsible based on the capabilities and talents He has given us. Responsibility of a person with ADHD and one who does not have ADHD is not the same. An insane person is not accountable. Quran says this in multiple ways. Keep your duty to Allah as much as you can. Chapter 64, uh, verse 16. Even in acts of worship, Allah expects us to perform them based on our abilities. Pilgrimage to Mecca is a duty people owe to Allah. For those who can afford, can make the journey. Chapter 3, verse 97. He knows the stages he has created us with. Allah creates you weak. After weakness, He gives you strength. And after strength, weakness and gray hairs. Chapter 30, verse 54. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها لا ما كسبت وعليها ما اكتسبت. 
God does not impose on anyone a responsibility beyond his ability. He gets every good that he earns, and he suffers every ill that he earns. Chapter 2, verse 286. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا ما آتاها. Allah does not charge any soul a responsibility beyond what He has given him. Chapter sixty-five, verse seven. Finally, to top it off, وَأَنْ لَيْسَ لِلْإِنْسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى وَأَنَّ سَعْيَهُ سُوَفَ يُرَى. That means that 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 man can have nothing but what he strives for, what he works for, and that his effort will be seen. Chapter 53, verses 39 and 40. Then there is, you know, other verses like Leman Shah, Menkum, and Yastaqim. Benefit is to whoever among you wills to go straight. Whoever among you wants to go straight. Chapter 81, verse 28. We have verses that say, جَزَاءً بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ as a reward for their deeds, like in chapter 32, verse 17. However, one must note that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of all things, creator of insan, he is also the creator of power, desires, wills, and deeds through what we have talked about. He is the ultimate creator and owner of all. Number six, justification after deeds. After doing the wrong deeds, one might say his sins of murder or fornication or stealing had been written for him. He's right. They have been. However, he cannot use that decree as an excuse. Allah has written his good servants and the bad servants along with their rewards and punishment, which are results of their deeds. Which are results of their deeds. Deeds that are means, asbab, and causation that carry him to the reward and punishment. In Allah's qada wa qadar, divine destiny, all these asbabs, asbab that, you know, the means and causations have been written. As such, when someone disbelieves and disobeys Allah, commits a sin. By his free will, he carries out what has been written for him. In other words, with his choice, he will make what has been written for him come true. Hence, earn Allah's punishment. So, arguing qada wa qadar as an excuse to justify committing sin is similar to the claim idolaters used to make. As the Quran says, the idolaters say, had Allah willed, neither we nor our fathers would have worshipped anything other than him. Nor would we have uh, been forbidding anything without him. Just like those before them. Chapter 16, verse 35. An, ex an excuse idolaters brought for their associating partners with God and claimed that we would not be idolaters if Allah wanted otherwise. Number seven. What about Adam alayhi salam? He sinned. Yes, we cannot deny the fact Adam alayhi salam sinned. As the Quran says, وَعَسَى آدَمُ رَبَّهُ فَقَوَى And Adam dis uh, disobeyed his Lord, so went astray. Chapter 20, verse 121. Disobedience of Allah the Creator is a sin, even if it is within qada wa qadar, what, on what Allah has written, His decree. One cannot consider even sin or wrongdoing to be outside of Allah's divine destiny. That is impossible, as no one can escape Allah's qada wa qadar. However, 
if we do not consider disobedience of God, which is within the divine destiny as a sin, then Iblis, Pharaoh, Nus people, and all the nations before and after them who disobeyed Allah, and in fact all disbelievers, could not be called sinners because they all acted within the divine destiny, within the Qada wa Qadar. So, what we are saying, they disobeyed within divine destiny out of their own free will. Number eight. Given what we have said so far, all the things we covered so far, what about يُذِلُّ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ This is another question that often comes up regarding the verses in the Qur'an that say فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يُذِلُّ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ Indeed, Allah leaves to stray whom He wills and guides whom He wills. They translate it literally as Allah leads astray whoever he wills and guides whoever he wills. Therefore, they conclude this is Jabr, determinism. And we have no choice as Allah guides some people and leads astray some others. So here, Allah's will within the Qadha wa Qadar is used as an, as an excuse or argument that regardless of what we do, we are predestined to do bad or good. Hence, predestined to go to hell or paradise. Here are the answers to that. First of all, the correct translation is as we mentioned first, which is, indeed Allah leaves to stray whom He wills and guides whom He wills. He does not lead to stray, but leaves to stray. In other words, we all need His guidance. Those who do not deserve his guidance, Allah will leave them alone without guidance. Only those who have taken the first inch, first step to earn his guidance, he will guide them. And without his guidance, we are all lost and go astray because our wants and desires will overcome our intellect and justify our misdeeds. If Allah wanted, He could have guided everyone, but then that would be the jab and determinism. Hence, there would be no concept of free will or punishments and rewards. However, Allah did give us free will to choose which path to take, His or others. We have to choose which path first and take the first step in order to qualify to earn his guidance. As the Qur'an says, and this is a very important verse, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِيْنَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَمَعَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Those who strive in us, in our cause, we surely guide them to our ways, our paths. And indeed, Allah is with the good doers, Muhsinin. Chapter 29, verse 69. Those who choose not to take that first inch, then Allah leaves them alone and leaves them be. Without His guidance, we're all lost. According to the verse and its sequence, because it's important, the sequence is very important. Those who want to be or should I say choose to be among the muhsineen, good doers, as it says at the end of the verse, they must first take this first step in God's path. He will then guide them in his ways. Then as a result, they will be among the muhsineen. That is the meaning of yudhillu man yasha'u wa yahdi man yasha'u. Furthermore, in many verses, the Qur'an says, Allahu la yahdi al-qawm al-zalimeen, wallahu la yahdi al-qawm al-fasiqeen. Allah will not guide the wrongdoers. 
He will not guide the unjust, the transgressors, the rebellious. There is an alternate way, alternate way to translate uh, this Yahdi man yasha, on Yuzaldo man yasha, which is, indeed Allah causes to stray. Indeed Allah causes to stray whom he wills and causes to be guided whom he wills, which confirms what we have talked about in points one through seven above meaning. You know, Allah has put all the asbab, means and causations, on this earth available for us to be either guided or go astray. It is us, humankind, who choose which path to take through these means and causations, as the Qur'an says, وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا and by the soul, human nafs, and him who perfected it and inspired it with conscience of what is wrong for it and what is right for it, uh, chapter 90, uh, 91, verses 7 and 8, these two verses are very important to note. Allah first swears by human nafs, soul. That is how important our nafs is, of course. Human nafs commits crimes too, but the verse is referring to the nafs in the beginning of a person's creation, where it is intact and free from any vice, evil, and impurity. Ma sawah, and then Allah sends him to this world with different kinds of capability, talents, and potentials. Ma sawah, and then gets specific on these potentials in the next verse. فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا Ilham or inspiration can also be called as the knowledge he put in human's essence, fitra. The knowledge that is innate when he's born. So when it says and inspired it with the conscience of what is wrong for it and what is right for it means from the very first day, Allah gave us the potential to distinguish wrong from right. It is in our essence, thought, or fitra, in our nafs DNA, if you will. And as we grow to adulthood, this potential is realized. This means regardless of our faith, or whether we even have a faith or not, we're not able to reject this fact that from the beginning we are able to distinguish the basics and of course in the adulthood it grows to be realized in the adulthood we are able to distinguish the basics of right from wrong based on human intellect, aql and conscious that Allah has given us. Laws within institution of religion just complete, confirm and strengthen these rights and wrongs. So back to our discussion, none can claim that a person with a sound mind has no choice but to do right or wrong and it is jabr. Secondly, Allah attributes being guided and astray to himself. Another question. Why does Allah attributes يُذِلُّ مَنْ يَشَاء وَيَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاء to himself? The answer is simple. Just like he placed asbab, means and causations, he also established natural laws, which means any action taken by anyone has consequences dictated by his laws, Allah's laws. As such, he attributes everything to himself because those laws are his. As an example, if a man decides to hurt himself or end his life by throwing himself from top of a tall bridge, God's law of gravity is, an, is in operation, and the minute he decides to step off the bridge, God's law will take over and kill him. 
In other words, once he steps off, he no longer has a choice. He's doomed and sentenced to death by God's law of gravity. So, after he steps off, it's Jabr. But before that, it's free will. God can attribute this man's death to himself because it is his law that caused this man's death. This man himself can attribute it to God as well. Say, God willed it. However, in reality, in reality, this man was in control all the way till he stepped off and could have decided not to. So it was his decision to do so, his choice, his action. God's asbab and causation in this case is that he created the bridge for people to go across. But it does, it does of course, it has a height and can be used as a mean to end one's life if he chooses to. We have all these means and causations surrounding us. It is up to us how to use them. Of course, we can go deeper into this, that what caused him to want to kill himself and all of those things. Uh, but again, all goes back to his personal choices. You can take this example figuratively and say all the means and causations to do evil and to do good are at our disposal. Once we make, make the choice on which to use and how to use it and for what goal to use it, that will determine whether we are destined to our success or our doom. God's divine destiny will reflect our decisions. I repeat, divine destiny will reflect our decisions. There are a couple of similar verses to Yudhillu man yasha wa yahdi man yasha, but say it differently. For the sake of completeness and just so there are no questions on these verses, we will explain them as well. Which, by the way, the explanation is similar to what we have said about Yudhillu man yasha wa yahdi man yasha. And these verses have the same connotation. In Surah Insan, verse 30, the Quran says, Yet you will not unless Allah wills. Surely Allah is knower, the knower, the wise. And in Surah Safat, verse 96, the Quran says, When Allah has created you and what you make. For the verse 30, Surah Insan, we need to look at the verse before. So we look at both verses 29 and 30 to get the full context. إِنَّ هَذِهِ تَذْكِرَ فَمَنْ شَاءَ تَخَذَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِ سَبِيلًا وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلِيمًا حَكِيمًا This is indeed a reminder, an admonition, that whosoever will, whosoever wants, may choose a path to his Lord. Yet you will not unless Allah wills. Surely, Allah is the knower, the wise. Chapter 76, verses 29 and 30. Verse 29 says, One who chooses, let him take a straight path to his Lord. It is a reminder that whoever chooses, he can have access to path of his Lord, which is the straight path. This verse is really another way of saying those who strive in us, in our cause, we surely guide them to our ways, our paths. In verse 2969, we talked about earlier. Both saying one has to take the first step into Allah's path in order to receive his guidance. But that first step is his choice. Then on verse 30, 
Surat Insan. It says, yet you will not, or you will not want, uh, you will not want unless Allah wills. Meaning, unless Allah provides you with asbab, means, and causations, you will not even be able to pursue such path. Allah's will here refers to His grace. Meaning, had He not given you all the asbab, you would not succeed. You would not have the tawfiq to choose His path. But at the same time, this grace, this grace of Allah is available to anyone who chooses and pursues Allah's path. Those who have good intentions and are fair-minded and want to pursue his path, plus stay away from evil and do good, then Allah would naturally, by his natural law, gives them the success and blessing through his will. Those, on the other hand, who have not good intention, are not fair-minded, and do injustice, Allah will not give them this success, this grace, this, this tawfiq, again, through His will. In fact, it says so in verse 31 that follows, He will admit to His grace whom He wills, but... For the wrongdoers, he has prepared a grievous penalty. Again, by the statement, he will admit to his grace whom he wills, he attributes everything to himself because he's talking about his laws in operation. His laws are in operation. And so because his laws are in operation, he attributes it to himself. It wants to say, uh, say to people that people will not seek or want God's path without His natural laws, which include means and causations and His grace. What are these means and causations? Very simple. In this case, unless they cleanse themselves from all evil and incline to do the right thing, then naturally Allah will show them the guidance. This verse by no means says that Allah just randomly and by jabr makes some people seek his path of truth and prevent others from it. Rather highlighting, you know, it highlights having good will and good intention along with clean heart before entering Iman and faith and says Allah must see these potentials in a person in order to lead their heart to seek in his path and path of Iman. Otherwise, those with ill intentions, biases who are unjust, by nature are not seeking the path of Allah. And as a result, they will be disadvantaged and deprived from Allah's path and guidance and have grave penalty waiting for them as verse 31 ends. Verse 30 is just to confirm that Allah has created you and given you all the ways and means and causations to get close to Him or strive in His path. There are similar verses, like in Surah Al-Muddathir, uh, verses uh, 55 and 56, which can be explained the same way. Once you learn this formula, you can apply it. Uh, now, the next verse we talked about, which is, وَاللَّهُ خَلَقَكُمْ وَمَا تَعْمَلُونَ Allah has created you and what you make. Chapter 37, verse 96. Some people cite this verse and say that Allah created us and our actions. Allah created us and our actions. So, why are we held accountable for our actions? They're not ours. The answer is simple. If that was the case, 
then what would be the point of reward and punishment or the day of judgment? What would it be the point of enjoining to do the right and forbidding the wrong? Did Allah create the actions of man who rapes or actions of a person who steals or actions of a king who persecutes? Of course not. So what is the verse referring to? Let's recite this verse and the verse before it together. قال أتعبدون ما تنحتون والله خلقكم وما تعملون He said, Do you worship what you yourself have carved when Allah has created you and what you make? Chapter 37, verse 90, verses 95 and 96. The verse is about a conversation between Ibrahim السلام, and the idol worshippers. As he tells them, do you worship these idols that you hand carved? You made yourself? Then in uh, verse 96, he continues, while you know Allah crea created you and what you make out of wood, your handwork. So, first of all, it was Ibrahim who said, Wallahu khalaqakum wa ma ta'amalu, not Allah. Secondly, the verse is referring to the fact that all the material they used and shaped to form their idols is created by the same God who created them. Just like saying Allah created me and my house and in fact everything around me. By no means it refers to the actions of individuals. In this case, obviously, Allah did not create their act of worshipping idols. Just like Allah did not create the action of a rapist. You see what happens when a verse is taken out of context? Ibrahim is telling them, why do you bow down to and worship things that you have made, made up with your hands? It is Allah who has created you and that which you have handcrafted. Again, ma ta'malun does not mean their act of idol worshipping. Because, it's, it's very clear, because if Allah created the act of idol worshipping, if that was the case, he could not blame the idol worshippers for it. In fact, no messenger of God, including Ibrahim salam, and God himself, could not blame any idol worshipper for his act of worshipping idols, if Allah created the act himself. And we have many verses in the Qur'an that condemn this act as the biggest sin and uh, say these idols that they built with their hands cannot help them. They cannot be benefited from them or harmed by them. So, there are verses like these we mentioned that on the surface and out of context appear to support Jabr, determinism. But... When you dig through them contextually and master the concept of asbabs, means, and causations, then you can understand the true meaning of these verses without the confusion about verses that they, you know, say the opposite. Thirdly, there are verses in the Quran that explain yudhillu man yasha wa yahdi man yasha. Here are a few examples. إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ لِلنَّاسِ بِالْحَقِّ فَمَنْ اِهْتَدَى فَلِنَفْسِهِ وَمَنْ ذَلَّ فَإِنَّمَا يَذِلُّ عَلَيْهَا وَمَا أَنْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِوَكِيلٍ Surely we have sent down to you, O Muhammad, the book for mankind with the truth. Whosoever is guided is guided for himself. And whosoever goes astray, it is only for his own loss. You are not their guardian. Chapter 39, verse 41. In this verse, the Quran says, Whoever goes astray, he has done so for himself. It is his own loss. 
or we can say only he is to be blamed. How can then this be understood as God's decision? Furthermore, at the end says to messenger of God that you are not assigned as their guardian. You are not set over them to dispose of their affairs. In other words, we have sent down the book with the guidance. After that, whatever they do, good or bad, they are doing it for themselves. They can't hold God responsible. Or even you, O Muhammad, cannot be responsible for their decisions and actions. Only they themselves are responsible for their decisions and actions. There are similar verses in the Quran, such as chapter 10, verse 108, or chapter 27, verse 92, which we will not cover here, but they are similar. Another explanation by the Quran, another way of explaining. وَمَنْ جَاهَدَ فَإِنَّمَا يُجَاهِدُ لِنَفْسِهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَقَنِيٌّ عَنِ الْعَالَمِينَ And whosoever strives, strives only for himself. Indeed, Allah is free of all needs. Chapter 29, verse 6, which is self-explanatory. Whoever strives, he is doing it for himself, meaning he will see the result or earn the rewards for it. Yet another example. Man ihtada fa innama yahtadi li nafsi wa man dhalla fa innama yadhillu alayha wa la tazru waziratun wizra ukhra. Whoever receives guidance receives it for his own benefit. Whoever goes astray does it to his own loss. No bearer of burden can bear the burden of another. Chapter 17, verse 15, which again talks about Allah will guide anyone who wants to be guided and leaves alone the one who wants to stray. As it says, whoever goes astray, he has done so based on his own decision. And that each person is accountable for his action and no one can carry his burden his sins, it's all on his own shoulder. قَدْ جَاءَكُمْ بَسَائِرُ مِنْ رَبَّكُمْ فَمَنْ أَبْسَرَ فَلِنَفْسِهِ وَمَنْ عَمِيَ فَعَلَيْهَا وَمَا عَنَ عَلَيْكُمْ بِحَفِيذٍ Indeed, have come to you from your Lord proofs to open your eyes. Whoever sees, it will be for his own good or for the good of his own soul. Whoever is blind, ignoring it, it will be to his own harm or his own loss. I am not a keeper over you. Chapter 6, verse 104. Another one. مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَلِنَفْسِهِ وَمَنْ أَسَاعَ فَعَلَيْهَا وَمَا رَبُّكَ بِذَلَّامٍ لِلْعَبِيدِ He who does good deed, right deeds, does so for himself, and he who does wrong deeds does so against his own. Your Lord is never unjust to his servants. Chapter 41, verse 46. In this verse, not only says that whoever does anything based on his own decision, he has done so for himself, it also says Allah is not unjust to his servants. Meaning Allah does not just randomly decide to take some people to hell and others to paradise. Hence, randomly punish and reward people. It is based solely on their a'mal, deeds. Another even clearer example. وَقُلِ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ Say, this is the truth from your Lord. Then whosoever will, let him believe. And whosoever will, let him disbelieve. Chapter 18, verse 29. Isn't this a clear example of full freedom to choose, even the faith? 
we will stop here and continue with the fourth explanation of Yudhilla man yasha wa yahdi man yasha. Then get into, after that, get into Jabr, determinism and ikhtiyar, free will. And answer a few questions along with examples, inshallah, in the next session. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal asri inna al-insana la fi khusr. Illa al-ladhina amanu wa amilu al-salihat. Wa tawasaw bil-haqqi. Wa tawasaw bil-sabr. Assalamu ala man ittaba'a hudar.